Hello and welcome to the next uh, next video. In this video, we're going to cover a fair bit of grounds. I don't think it's going to be a long video, but there's going to be a number of different subtopics within this one. Here we're going to be looking at tests on two populations, uh, specifically on two population means. Now, from your readings, from your studyings, uh, you may recall that there's uh, a couple of broad categories here. We have the first category is when our means, our samples are independent. And when our samples are independent, within that, there were two scenarios pertaining to any information we have about the population variance. Now, again, I understand that we can get into a discussion here on t-tests and z-tests. Not going to worry about the z-test aspect of um, testing two population means. Certainly, it's feasible, it exists, but it's rare, it's unlikely. More often than not, when you're working with real data, you'll be using t-tests. So that's what I'm going to focus on here. So when I talk about uh, population variance, I don't mean to say we know the population variance, but it has to do with whether or not we can assume that the variances, although unknown, are they equal? Yes or no. So we can either assume that they're equal or we cannot assume that they're equal. And this is, you know, we could get into a big discussion on this, and, and I do in my other videos with my, my statistics workbook, we talk a lot more about this and the differences. But here in Excel, there's two different tools, depending on what we can assume about those population variances. So those two fall under the category of, are our samples independent? The other, is a matched sample. And a matched sample uh, is one where I have two data points from each um, experimental unit, okay? And, and again, I'm focusing here on the Excel discussion, not the concepts, not the theory, not the interpretation. There's other videos for that. So what this means is that when we go into Excel, we're gonna be looking at three different tools. We'll be looking at one where we have independent samples where we can assume that the variances are equal. We'll have another one where we have independent samples where we cannot assume that the variances are equal. And then we'll have a third one where we have a matched sample. Now, once again, I'm not working with any context. I'm not working with any particular problem. The focus here is how to get the results that you will need for whatever problem you might be working on. So when I come into Excel, I have a generic data set, and we're going to use this same data set for all three of those different tools, okay? So... Now we're going to get into using the data analysis. I know in the previous videos, looking at single population tests, Z test, T tests, and proportions, we actually didn't even use this tool pack. Now we're going to use it. So everything here is uh, alphabetical. In the earlier video, we did talk about the descriptive statistics command. We use that both for summary statistics and for intervals. Now I'm going to scroll down towards the bottom and here you see our three t-tests. As I said, there's also a z-test here. I'm not going to talk about it, but it's very, very similar to the t-tests. So first, let's assume equal variances. For some reason, we have reason to believe the population variances are equal. Maybe you've gotten into how to do tests on variance, that would be an F test to test for the equality of the variance, then you know what to assume about it. Here, we'll go in and see how we can do this test. Okay, now it is very important that we define our terms properly. When you're doing these two population tests, any of those variants of the two population tests, you know, and I'm sure that it's been talked about in your class, that when I have two populations, 
let's say I'm, I'll set it up like this for now. The distinction between an upper tail test and a lower tail test now becomes very, very trivial because I can perform exactly the same test in two different ways, right? If I wanted to do a test to see whether or not, um, I don't have much of props to work with here, whether or not red pens are heavier than white pens, whatever. So is this on average a red pen? Is it heavier than this white pen? Well, to me, that sounds like an upper tail test. And so I might say, okay, well, make that red pen population one and make that white pen population two. And I want to see if the red pen is heavier than the white pen. Well, if that's the case, then actually what I have here is wrong. Because if that's the case, I'm going to set this up this is always one minus two. So this is going to be my red pen and this is going to be my white pen. And I want to see is the red pen heavier than the white. So there's my upper tail test. That is population one. That is population two. That must be consistent with how I enter it into Excel. But again, this is a little bit trivial because what if I switched those definitions and what if I said that my white pen is population one, red pen is population two. Well, what happens? Again, for whatever reason, I'm wanting to test to see if red pens are heavier than white pens. And so in this context, with that definition, I have it set up as an upper tail test. But now, testing to see if the red pen is heavier than the white pen, isn't that the same as testing that the white pen is not as heavy as the red? So if I change my definitions, it changes the nature of that test. It goes from being an upper tail test to now it's a lower tail test. Both of them are correct. One of them might make a little more sense than another, but they're both perfectly correct. They'll both give consistent results. If the red pen is in fact heavier, I'll reject. I'll get the same p-value. I'll reject in either case. I'll still get the same finding. Point of the story is we have to be very careful how we define our terms. And when I enter that into Excel, here I have to be perfectly consistent with what is my variable one and what is my variable two. Okay, so here I have, I've labeled them variable one and two in your assignment probably won't be quite so blatantly obvious. I'm going to select variable one. Notice I am picking up the labels. Here's variable two. What is my hypothesized difference? That's asking what is this value here? More often than not, it's going to be zero. But maybe you're testing to see that that difference is less than some specific value or greater than some specific value, some number other than zero. If your assignment of the problem doesn't give you an obvious magnitude of the difference, then it's zero. If it's something other than zero, it's going to say that number, you know, test to see that the red pen is five ounces heavier than the um, white pen, something like that. Okay. So in this example, that hypothesized difference is zero. Now I did select the labels. So I have to tell Excel, I select the labels. If I don't, I'll just get an error. If you didn't select the labels, don't say that you did because then it'll, it'll alter your data set a little bit. I'll show you what I mean in a second. What is your level of significance? whatever you want it to be or whatever is in the problem, the, the assignment, um, a reasonable number, output range, where do you want the output to go? And so here we are. Let's put it there. Okay. Now, generally, um, for my students, this gives more information than I want to see in your assignments. But not all instructors are the same. 
Generally speaking, I don't care about any of this because I will have already seen that elsewhere in the assignment. What I would want to see here is your test statistic and a p-value. So this number here, this is my test statistic. That's an important one. The p-value, as you know, as we've talked about in many other videos, the p-value depends on what kind of test you're doing, a lower tail test, an upper tail test, or a two tail test. And Excel makes an assumption about what probability you want. Here, I have a negative test statistic. So when I look at these numbers here, well, I've got a couple numbers. I've got one tail, and here I've got two tail. This two tail value, that's just twice the one tail value. If you're doing a two tail test, there's your p-value right there. So if I'm doing a two tail test, it's giving me my p-value. The tricky part is if you're doing a one tail test, because if I'm doing a one tail test, it matters if it's an upper tail or lower tail. So here I have a negative test statistic, negative 1.28. It's giving me a probability of 0.1. Is that an upper tail or a lower tail value? Well, certainly if I draw a distribution and I have a test statistic of negative one point, was it negative 1.28? Yes. Is that probability of 0.1, is that this area here or is it this area here? Pretty straightforward, I hope. It's going to be this lower tail. So when Excel sees a negative test statistic, it's going to give you, for the one tail probability, a lower tail value. If I'm doing a lower tail test, that's my p-value. If I'm doing an upper tail test, one minus that to get my p-value. If I had a positive test statistic, Excel is going to give me an upper tail probability. Now, in fact, we can see that because if I just do exactly that same test, except I'm going to switch my definitions around, all that's going to change here is the sign on my test statistic. And so there I've got all of the same results. Oops. All of those same numerical results. My test statistic is now a positive. And that upper that probability, well, that probability is exactly the same. Excel saw a positive test statistic, it's now giving me an upper tail probability. If I'm doing an upper tail test, great, that's my p-value. If I'm doing a lower tail test, one minus that to get my p-value. Notice, of course, that two tail p-value unaffected. Still 0.21, it's still twice that probability. Okay, so this is what we would do if we were doing a t-test assuming equal variances. And here I've done it two different ways, just by switching my definitions, you'll notice doesn't do much to the output, changes the sign on my test statistic, that's about it. But again, make sure that you define your terms in a way that is consistent with your um, hypothesis test formulation. One more thing before I move on, very quickly, whoops, if I did not select my labels. Let's say I did not select my labels here and here. This is a very common mistake, but I say that I did select my labels. Look what happens. Excel has now picked up that first value, 57.43. It's picked that up as a label. 6351, it's picked that up as a label. It's changed my results. Now everything is off by a little bit. So be very cautious um, about making that mistake. It's a very common mistake that I see students make and it can throw things off a little bit. Okay, so I said I was gonna do all of the different tests in this one video, so let's get through it. So that's assuming equal variance. If we could not assume equal variance, we're assuming unequal variance. Well, let's go through that. Again, I'm going to select the labels here in both of these samples. 
hypothesize mean different than zero. I did select the labels, whatever your level of significance, you can put that there. And here's my output. Okay, and you'll notice it looks very similar to the previous output. Let me just clean this up a little bit. It looks very similar to what we have here, right? The difference being, well, when we assume unequal variance, as you may have talked about in class, certainly in my class, if we go through that big nasty calculation for degrees of freedom when you have un unequal variances. So here the degrees of freedom is different. In this example, not by much. It would be un unfortunate to go through that big calculation for the degrees of freedom to only see it differs by one. But that degree of freedom calculation is different. And here we're using, remember, that pooled variance to calculate um, the standard error for that test statistic. So small differences, nothing major. In fact, in this example, we see it has no noticeable impact on the results. That may not necessarily be the case. Depends on just how different the variances are between your two samples. So in this case, very similar. The output is um, identical. Here's my test statistic. Here's my one-tailed p-value. Here's my two-tailed p-value. Once again, if you have a negative test statistic, that one tail p-value is coming from the lower tail. If you have a positive test statistic, that p-value is going to come from the upper tail. Okay. And last but not least, if we go through the next, which is the matched sample, Excel calls this the paired two sample for means. So now this is a different experimental design where I have two data points. So where each of these data points would be coming from one common experimental unit. So I might have a data set that looks something like this, which leads me to believe that this is a matched sample design. Whatever the context is, I don't know, but I have two data points for each of those experimental units. Now, when you would have done this in class, this is the one where we would have talked about those difference values, right? And we would have had to calculate 1 minus 2 or 2 minus 1, whatever the case might be. And then we had to get all of those values. And then we had an average difference and a little bit tedious to do it in the classroom, a little bit tedious to do it by hand. In Excel, we don't have to do any of that. In Excel, I come into data analysis. I've got paired to sample. Select again, I need to be consistent with how I select my data. Because if I'm doing a one tail test, whether or not it's upper tail or lower tail depends entirely on how I define my terms. So once again, I'll just go through left to right. Here's population one and population two. Depending on the context of the problem that you're working with, it might make more sense to do it the other way. That's entirely up to you. Hypothesize mean difference. Again, we can put in a zero here. If you're testing for a specific magnitude of the difference, if it says in the problem somewhere you want to see if the, the average difference is something more than five or less than three or whatever the case might be, you would see in that problem a specific magnitude of a difference. If no magnitude is given, it's zero. Once again, I did select the labels. Output, let's put it over here. And away we go. And again, you see an output that looks very similar to the other outputs that we have from those other tests. Once again, I don't need to see any of this because I would have already had my students provide a table of descriptive statistics and everything is already there. All I would want from this output is, again, there's that test statistic. And here's our probabilities for our p-values. If I'm doing a one-tail test, let me just clean this up a little bit. If I'm doing a one-tail test, 
Well, I have a negative test statistic, so there's a lower tail probability, 0.11. Notice it is a little bit different. We're using the same data, yes, but we're treating it differently. So there's some differences here now. So this is a negative test statistic, and so this is a lower tail value. If I'm doing a lower tail test, then that's my p-value. If I'm doing an upper tail test, one minus that. You're starting to see a pattern here if you've been watching these videos. If I'm doing a two-tail test, there's my two-tail p-value. It's already doubled, so don't double it again. If I'm doing a two-tail test, that's that one-tail value multiplied by two. Now, there's some rounding error here, so it doesn't look like it is, but if we expand it, you can see that it, it in fact is. Okay, so that's about it. You've got everything you need now to do any kind of two population test on means, whether or not they are independent and you can assume equal variance, independent assuming unequal variance, or a matched sample design. Good, that's it. Thank you for watching. I hope that that was helpful. Take care. Bye-bye.